Oh, good. I am now. Good. Welcome Great. to a yep. beautiful wet Sunday. Nothing. We beautiful. love this rain. We, we need this rain. Well, today. And we hear Bob talking. Just wait. Okay, so welcome now to let's start with our call to worship, please, this morning. Let us pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to be here today, to hear your word, to be obedient to your call on our lives. Because there are times, Lord, when life gets in the road of our obedience, when the realities of a busy life rushed, rushed, short of time, poor organisation, Father, we tend to forget you. People say sometimes, I'm so busy, I've got no time to pray. When the reality is, I'm so busy, I need to pray first so I know what is important. So speak to our hearts this morning. Open our eyes. Open our minds. Open our minds to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'd like to say before we go any further, welcome to everyone here gathered here today in the building. Welcome to those who are watching us online live this morning and to those who will be watching later this afternoon, we give you God's blessing and God's welcome. Thank you. Come now to our announcements as he puts his glasses on and hands over to Sue. Thank you. Um, can I just draw a few things to your attention? I've printed off, I'm, I'm struggling to find the right number of, of notices to print and we don't need to waste anything at all. So um, I probably will reduce the number of notice, printed notices quite a bit because there are a lot left over. But you always get them on, on email. So you know, however you get your notices, these are highlights. Courtyard Coffee has, was on last Friday. It's on again regularly now. Um, there is Tweet today. Those who eat alone talk to themselves. So you could stay back. Um, and um, join them for, for Tweet. On Thursday, we had a very productive meeting of our planning meeting for all our jumpers and jazz activities. The next New Horizons, which is going to be out this next Sunday, will have a whole blurb about that. So we're very excited. We have our jazzy breakfast on the first Saturday. We have courtyard coffee on that Saturday and then through Monday to Friday the next week. We have a tree that will be decorated and we have um, a surprise, a surprise <laughs> to, get, to get with our score theme that we are endeavouring to fit through, um, through our display for Jumpers and Jazz. Really, it's just um, our, our way of saying we are part of a lively community, come join us, come enjoy it too. So that's what we aim for. If you are not in a hospitality team, Consider being in one. We really you know, encourage people to be in one of our four hospitality teams. It means welcoming people at the door, as Anne has given. She gave some people a cuddle um, today, because she's like that, um, and to hand, it, to hand out notices and to provide and, and set up for morning tea too. So it's, it's one time every, every month. Um, so if you are able to do, think you'd be able to do that, then come and see me or somebody else you think might know something about it. We have a birthday list at the back here. Lynn's not here today. Um, Bob is here. Happy birthday in April, Bob. Um, Marion May is here. And Daphne is here too. Happy birthday. Um, we won't count the candles for anybody just now. So read all of these carefully. It's an exciting building up time to something that we do each year, but it's exciting to be part of it. Thank you. Okay, our first hymn from TIS will be number 426, Spirit of Truth, Essential God.
Thank you. We come now to our time for prayer of confession and then the words of assurance. Let us, let us open our hearts before God now. Father, as I said in the opening call to worship, there are many times, Lord, when we hear your call and we'll often walk the opposite direction because we feel the task is too big, the demands are too great, we're not qualified, we're not skilled, we feel unworthy to do your will because we know our innermost hearts. So Father, forgive us for those times of disobedience when we fail to realise that you know us better than we know ourselves. That you don't call the qualified, you qualify the called. That we do it in your strength, Lord, and yours alone. Forgive our frailty, Lord, when we cannot see beyond our own grief and despair, when we cannot see you in the greater scheme of things. Forgive us, Father, when the times we just do not confess these failings to you because we're afraid of expressing our weaknesses to you. Forgive us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. And I can say, therefore, when we confess our sins before God, he is just and right and willing through the blood of Jesus to forgive us. So I can say to us, our sins are forgiven. Amen. Our next song is Thanks to God, whose word was spoken.
Today's reading is coming from Luke 24, 13 to 27, the walk to Emmaus. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had just happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. Yes, besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they indeed had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all these scriptures. May God add his blessing to this reading. I love the godly play language that says that Easter is so big that you need at least six Sundays to do Easter. Uh, and so for all of you who thought that Easter was last Sunday and it's all over, it's every Sunday until the ascension on the 9th of May. So I love the second Sunday of Easter because by now some of that stuff, because I don't think Easter Sunday, we profess that hallelujah, Jesus is risen, but I don't think that very first Easter, the people really realized that Jesus was risen. We hear that they unbelieved, they didn't believe, they uh, you, you can see that it only started to drop in that light bulb moment after that first Sunday. So it's good for us to continue on our Easter journey. It's, uh, it's not over, and we thank God for that. As the Ministers Association, we meet monthly to discuss and pray for issues in our community and in our town, and we try and collaborate and work together as, as much as we can and to try and be an example to the rest. Um, we've had wonderful collaborations already this year uh, with uh, our brothers and sisters in the faith uh, when we did the, the World Day of Prayer together. Wonderful sign of unity and coming together. Uh, at our last meeting, actually two meetings ago, Darren from the Baptist Church said that they've invited the guest preacher to come and to do uh, a Shabbat meal and Passover meal with them and so they've invited Bob Mendelssohn to come from Juice for Jesus to, to come and do this and um, can another congregation please help for a preaching place on this Sunday and I was like yes of course we would love to do that We'd love to have this as an Easter gift to us as well and so Bob welcome there are a lot of things that we all have in common so let me try and give you a few my first connection with Jews for Jesus started about 25 years ago when I went with Jews for Jesus to Israel on a trip. And so I've been blessed with that connection. We worship in a church um, that some people said look more Jewish than Christian <laughs> at, a, at one stage with menorahs and all kinds of things. Uh, but it's been a journey, a long journey and an ongoing journey. So I was delighted to 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 know that there's Jews for Jesus also in Australia so and New Zealand. Um, a lot of our members here, um, Ian has gone to Israel for some uh, uh, digs. Ian, show your hand. There we go. <laughs> Spent some time in Israel on some digs and Bethsaida, and so he's also well connected. 
Um, so we are absolutely delighted to have you. And we trust that last night at the Baptist was great. Well. And <laughs> we look forward to hear all the stories. Uh, Bob is the representative for Jews for Jesus in Australia and New Zealand and for a long time already, I think past 25 years plus. Uh, but I'm going to ask Bob to introduce him to uh, himself to you uh, and tell us a little bit more before he gets into his message. Thanks, Bob. Welcome. Thanks, Auntie. Thanks so much. Welcome. Shalom. I'll speak in English. Um, <clears throat> I grew up, you can hear this is a North American accent, I grew up in Kansas City, right in the middle of the U.S., as an Orthodox Jew, full on in Orthodox Jewish practices, Jesus and uniting and Presbyterian, who knows what that is, it's Catholic, it's just not us. So I had no interest in or uh, keen connection with anything Christian. It, was about 1971. I was a 19 year old hippie, a university drug. I'll calculate for I'm 72. Um, I <laughs> saved you all that mathematics. Uh, and I was a hippie, a university dropout, looking for meaning and relevance, like all of us did in those days. And I wasn't looking for Jesus Christ, but it was in encountering several of you guys that I found. Somebody had guts, chutzpah, really, enough to share the good news of Jesus with me. And though I won a Bible battle with some of them, about uh, a month later, two months later, I was encountered by some more Jesus people who shared with me their Bible. I won the Bible battle with them, but I went back where I was staying and I started reading that Catholic portion of the Bible, you know, St. Matthew, St. Mark. We didn't have St. Saint, Saint Moses, so, you know, this is the Catholic side. And I found in there the consummate hippie, the man of peace and love and meaning and relevance, and there it was in Jesus. So three days after that last encounter, I gave my life to Jesus, and strangely he took it, and he's made something out of my life, which was a serious mess. And God is uh, still holding on to me. He doesn't let go. Aren't you glad for that? Um, I got married some years later, and we're married 47 years now with uh, my wife in, uh, down in, we, we live in Sydney, lived there for the last 26 years. We have three adult children who've given us six, soon to be this weekend, seven grandchild. We don't know when, I keep checking my phone, because, you know, that's how people talk to each other. Yeah. So that's uh, personal life ministry continues. And uh, I see, I don't see retirement yet in the scripture. One day maybe, but I don't see it yet. Well, that's a bit of my story. There's lots more on the table in the uh, fellowship hall. What we, I don't know what we call it. In the parish hall, uh, there is a table of display with uh, books and CDs and all kinds of things, including my testimony book, which you can pick up later. But we're in the scriptures. We're in Luke 24. And this is that great road to Emmaus. Thanks for that good reading. So if you, do we put it up there or you have it in your Bible? You're just trusting me. Okay. Wow, I could do any number of things, except you're recording this for Facebook Live and YouTube Live. So I've got to stick with what is. All right, Luke 24. On that same day, two of the disciples were kind of disappointed, weren't they? Cleopas and his friend, could be Mrs. Cleopas, were rearranging the pebbles as they walked back towards Emmaus, just about 12K from where they were in Jerusalem. And they're encountered by this risen Savior. They don't know who he is. They haven't seen the DVD. So they don't know that Jesus is alive and well. So Jesus says, what's going on? And they say, what are you like from New Zealand? You're the only visitor who doesn't know what's going on? And he says, what thing? And they say, the things about Jesus of Nazareth. We thought he was the Messiah. We hoped he was going to redeem Israel. Now, when you hear that as Christians who sing all these good words about redemption and blood and forgiveness, okay, you get it. But they didn't get it. Because redemption for Jewish people then, and dare I say to this day, is still national. It's still political. It's get 
Well, who was it in those days? It was Rome that was the bad guys. The Romans were dominating the Jewish people there in the land of Israel, and we had to, we wanted to get rid of them. You don't want your governor or premier general, your governor general or premier, you don't want the prime minister telling you how to run worship, please. So we didn't want the, the governor in Rome to tell us how to have religion. But that, I'm afraid, is what was. So redemption for the Jewish people then was get Rome off our back. In modern days, I remember being an 11-year-old with a picket sign out front of the Russian embassy, save Soviet Jewry, because there were three million Jewish people living in the former Soviet Union who were not allowed to practice our religion. So we wanted Russia off our back. They were the bad guys when I was a kid. Who it is today, I'll, I'll leave that to your politicians and media. And, and you to talk about. Okay. Um, we thought he was going to redeem Israel. Verse 21 says that. And it also says, and besides that, it's already the third day since these things happened. Okay, third day. Well, you know it because we've been, you know, we led up to Easter with Lent. And then we had Easter and third day and Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. You know, we had, we've got our, our, our style, our liturgy. And so we're third day people, but they weren't third day people, not yet, besides third day. So let me tell you a story. 1994, a rabbi died in Brooklyn, New York. That's, that's not news, really. When you think about it, there are 500,000 Jews who live in Brooklyn alone. Five, half a million. So you got to figure every year there'll be at least one obituary with one rabbi who dies. Okay, but this was the Rebbe. This was Menachem Mendel Schneerson. This was the most famous rabbi of the day. And to this day, there are still some in Israel and New York and dare I say in Sydney who still think he's the Messiah. A claim he never knocked back. He was over 90 years old when he passed that summer of 94. And the next day, and the second day, people gathered at his gravesite, not only to pay him respect, but to await his imminent resurrection. You see, the rabbis teach that the spirit of a man hovers over its corpse for three days. And on the fourth day, it departs. Maybe that helps you understand why Jesus waited two extra days to go visit Eliezer. You call him Lazarus. To make sure he was dyingly dead. He was, there was no hope of yet getting back up. So on the third day, there was great hope at Schneerson's gravesite there in New York. But on the fourth day, almost all of the folks left. And certainly by now, only a guard is there. They were right. The Messiah would die. They were right. Messiah would rise from the dead before the fourth day. They were wrong. It wasn't a rabbi in Brooklyn. What they should have known, I want to help you get this morning. So I want to ask, I'm going to keep my marker there. I'm going to ask, do you, do you like jigsaw puzzles? Do you like some of them? Yeah, I can't stand them. Um, I mean, give me a golf club, give me a, a book. I'm, I'm much happier. But my family loves them, and so we buy them, and we you know, spend countless hours putting these pieces together. You want it together, just buy a picture with a card. Anyway, the, uh, if you do them right, and I'm no expert, I've just said that. If you do it correctly, here's how you put together a jigsaw puzzle. You uh, buy, it's Ken Duncan or whatever. So you buy it and then uh, you open it and you, and you pour out all the pieces, set them all right side up and then look one last time at the box top and put it away. Then you start putting the pieces together and you watch a picture emerge. I'm going to ask you to do what I ask Jewish folk down in Sydney or in Israel or New York, wherever I get to go. I'm going to ask you to do what I ask them to do. Put away the box top of what you already believe about the Messiah. Let's put the pieces of the puzzle there and let's be honest about what we see as a picture emerges. Is that fair enough? Okay. 
So I'm going to look at three Bible passages, one from Torah, one from Nevi'im, one from Ketuvim, Law, Prophets, and Writing, and see what they say to us as we put them on our table. Okay, first is in Genesis 3. you got to figure it says, remember he said, beginning with Moses, meaning the five books of Moses, and all the prophets, Jesus had a Bible class. Wow. What? I want to see that DVD when I go to heaven. Jesus' greatest sermon, I think, ever to two people. Yeah. Genesis 3, verse 15. Many of you would know this. This is Garden of Eden. This is the snake. This is the, the conflict. This is the curse, the fall of man. The Lord placed... Uh, <laughs> Chapter 3, Bob. Um, chapter 3, verse 15. He said to the woman, I said to the serpent, here it is. <clears throat> um, I, will, I will make you and the woman hate each other. <laughs> Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will crush his heel. Three puzzle pieces I'm going to put on the table. Number one, Messiah will be the seed of the woman. By the way, all Jewish people believe this is the Messiah. It's rabbinic. It's concluded. This is clear. It's not Bob making this up. First mention, it's the Proto-Evangelion, as you learned at Bible College. And, uh, the first mention of the good news of Scripture in the Bible. The, the seed of the woman. You think, Bob, that's not exactly a clue. Everybody's born of a woman, right? wrong. Not in Judaism. Abraham beget Isaac. Thank you, Sarah. Isaac beget Jacob. Where's Rebecca? You with me? Men have children genealogically. My Hebrew name is Reuben ben Eliahu. Reuben, the son of my father's name. Not my mother. Now, biologically, I know how this works. I told you I've got lots of kids and grandkids. So I know how takes two to tango, so you'd be the seed of the man and woman, or the seed of the man. But it says it's the seed of the woman only. It doesn't say virgin birth, but it anticipates it. Second puzzle piece is this, this conquest, this crushing of the head of the serpent. I love that, because I'm a male. We love crushing things. You know, you put two little girls in a room with a tea set, and they'll be making tea. Put two little boys in a room with the same tea set and they'll be playing rugby. That's just that's who we are. Um, crushing things. So when I was a kid, who was going to win the Messiah? Over whom was he going to win? Over the Russians. Right? Because they were the bad guys. And so the Messiah would conquer. I love that. Third puzzle piece, surprising as all get out, he will crush your heel. What? The Messiah would be wounded? No, the Messiah is going to win. He's going to conquer. Yeah, no, there's going to be some pain and suffering in his heel. There's going to be a wound there. And the rabbis even quote from Isaiah 53 about this and cite this in the, in the interpretation book, Genesis Rabbah, of this text. So do we have enough to know who it is? Not yet. So we're going to flip to, I'm going to flip, you're going to trust me, to Micah chapter 5. You watching at home, open your Bibles and have a go. There you go. Micah 5, or if you're in jail or wherever you are. Um, Micah 5, this is a prophet hundreds of years before Jesus. And we read this. People of Jerusalem, gather your forces. We are besieged. They are attacking the leader or the ruler of Israel. The Lord says, Bethlehem Ephratah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah. Think Kalarni. Okay. Um, but out of you, I will bring a ruler for Israel whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Three more puzzle pieces going on the table. Number one, Messiah would be beaten. He'd be wounded, struck on the cheek with a rod. You'd think that the rabbi, Cleopas, didn't you ever see this before? Mendelssohn, didn't you ever see this? Yeah, I, we read it, but that doesn't mean, you know, you read things over and over and you still don't get it. You know what I'm talking about. I'm not talking husbands of what your wives tell you about selective seeing and hearing. Um, maybe I am. Uh, 
Have you seen the FedEx delivery truck? <laughs> FedEx, let's, let's pop that on, the FedEx delivery truck. So um, now this is the logo of the FedEx. The guy wears it on his uh, shirt and it's all over the trucks. And you've seen that all over the country, all over the world. It's, a federal, it's an international company. So if I say to you, you've seen the FedEx arrow, haven't you? You'd say, well, um, sure, you'd say that because you're nice people. But do you see an arrow? Okay, you're first. Keep looking between the orange E and the orange X, a right-facing arrow. And you think, when did they put that there? How did they stick that? Somebody's living, you know, a luxurious life who started that thing. Right? But you're thinking, wow, I've never seen that before. Why didn't you see it? You saw it, but you didn't see it. You see what I mean? You saw it, but you didn't see it because nobody showed it to you. But now that you've seen it, I can't wait. You're going to be at a cafe um, in Brizzy, and a truck's going to come up, and you're going to sit with the people next to you and say, see the arrow? You're going to be really, you know... <laughs> the proselytizer of the FedEx arrow, right? So you're going to say, and they'll say, no, I don't see, oh, and the penny will drop. I use this, Hansi, to talk about evangelism. And Easter is a great time. I'm sorry I wasn't here a week before. I would have encouraged you to bring your own neighbors and, and people you like and people you don't like. I mean, just bring anybody to come because... Um, Easter and Christmas seem to be times when we can invite folks to, to carols in the car park or wherever you have them, right? And people will come and they'll bring wine and cheese and sit and listen to Hark the Herald Angels Sing and Glory to the Newborn King. They've sung it, they've heard it, but they've never really heard it. So our job as believers is to help the unbelievers to see what they've seen but never seen. You help them see I know that's a long way to say it, but does that make sense? So you can take that down. Thanks. Um, I can't wait to hear stories from you. I saw the arrow. Okay. Uh, so number one, the, the wounding, uh, the strike in the cheek. Secondly, the birthplace of Messiah, Bethlehem. Bethlehem Ephratah, specific Bethlehem. Why? You know, it's a little country bumpkin town beyond the black stuff. This is a nowhere's village. But it was specific and it was there that King David was born, of course. But it was also there that the greater son of David was born, Jesus. And so remember the, the, the wise men, the magi came looking for the king of the Jews. Here are these Gentiles, God bless you like so many of you, um, looking for the king of the Jews. That's a whole story in itself. What are Gentiles doing looking for the Jewish king? But they rock up to Jerusalem. That's where kings should be born. You know, not Tamworth. Not Yass. Okay, so um, I love both of those, by the way. Don't, don't pay me out. Uh, so they rock up to Jerusalem. Where is he? Who's born? King of the Jews. And they say, go check out back. And they cite this Bible text. Third Bible text, a third puzzle piece, is that his goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Long ago, the Hebrew word is kedem, mi kedem. Kedem geographically means to the east. So it doesn't mean that the Messiah will be born in India, because we know he's in Bethlehem. But this from kedem, it's translated in every Bible version as chronology, not geography. He's, he's from long ago. Look, we use the phrase uh, uh, from yesterday, way back when. Yeah, that's, that's what approximates this. So this one who's born in Bethlehem pre-existed way back when. Do we have a not, not yet, not yet. So I'm going to back up a couple pages to Daniel chapter 9. And it's a prophecy of that. You say, well, it's a prophet. Yeah, but it's in the section in the Jewish Bible called the writing that starts with the Psalms and has many others. Daniel 9, for this I'm going to need glasses. And it starts at about verse 24. Seventy times seven. Seven years, 70 years 
is the length of time God has set for freeing your people and your holy city from sin and evil. Sin will be forgiven and eternal justice established so that the vision and the prophecy will come true and the holy place will be rededicated. What's the holy place for Jewish people? Jerusalem and the temple specifically. That's right. So this is writing about a time called what we call the second temple period. And we'll make that much clearer here in just a moment. Verse 25, note this and understand it. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah comes, until the anointed one comes, there'll be seven years and seven, 70 times, there'll be 490. I was a math teacher. I could do this. <laughs> Jerusalem will be built with streets and strong defenses and will stand for, 70, for 62 sevens. But this will be a time of troubles. And at the end of that time, God's chosen leader will be killed unjustly. And the city and the temple will be destroyed. Three more puzzle pieces I'm putting on there. Number one, Messiah will die. Now in your version that you probably have, it says Messiah will be cut off. That doesn't mean cut off from his allowance. It means cut off out of the land of the living. This version, which I borrowed out of your narthex, um, is, it says it, it interprets it for us as killed. And that's right. Which may be why the Lubavitcher Hasidim in New York were not surprised when Menachem Schneerson died. Messiah will die. Okay, Messiah will die. Okay. Uh, Rambam, the great Maimonides, medieval rabbi, and one of the greatest ten thinkers in Judaism ever, said Messiah will die and his son or his grandson will take over. So that doesn't surprise them. It's just not a guy in Brooklyn. Because the second puzzle piece is the time of the death of Messiah. And that's where the 70 times 7 and the, the 490 and the 483. Look, I've got a book over, wouldn't you know, over in the uh, parish hall called Yeshua, written by Moish Rosen. He's the founder of Jews for Jesus. He was my mentor for 30 years until he passed about 14 years ago. And in one, this is all on messianic prophecies, like I'm giving you today. Um, Yeshua is the Jewish way to say Jesus, that's all. And uh, for a couple pages, in just two pages, I think he unpacks this prophecy with the details of 483 years from this and that. And what, is, what are the dates? It's from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which happened in 444 BCE. BC for those previous notations. Add to that 483 years, add to that, and subtract this and leave out the zero year. Anyway, it's all detailed right here in this book that's on the not-so-free side of the table. But um, you'll be able to get that and be amazed. But if you miss it, if you miss the details because you, your pocket abacus isn't working, then I want you to note this, that the decree is listed as the beginning of a time clock, and then it ends with the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's 70 AD, the end of the second temple period. So whatever that time period is between 450 BC and 70 AD, and towards the end of it, what we call first century, that's when Messiah will die. It's a puzzle piece. And the, the, the last puzzle piece is right there at the beginning of verse 24, 25. Sin will be forgiven, eternal justice established. The purpose of the death of Messiah. See, when I was a kid, I was the third of three children which means I never got anything new. Hand me down. <laughs> which for my, for my brother was fine. My sister, I didn't want some of those things. <laughs> so I'd ask my dad, some, you know, we were poor, and I'd say, Dad, when am I, I don't know, get like a new bicycle? He'd say, yeah, when the Messiah comes. So I was really hopeful that the Messiah would come so I could get new transportation. That would be awesome. 
But here it says the purpose of the death of Messiah was not to give me a bike, but to forgive my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So we've got nine puzzle pieces, one's a repeat, maybe two are repeats. We've got the Messiah who's born of a woman, not of man and woman, born in Bethlehem, though he ever existed. He was wounded in his heel, he was beaten on the cheek, and he dies. It happens in the first century of the common era. It happens to crush the head of the serpent and conquer sin, if you will, and to forgive me of my sins. Box top away. You have any candidates? Honestly, there's only one. His name is Jesus. Yeshua. And you're saying, Bob, this is great. We're, I, thanks for telling us. We, we know this part already. We're, we're in church. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Good. Why don't you go down to Bondi Beach and talk to Israelis who are visiting? And why don't you go to New York and Brooklyn, 500,000 Jews, and go to Israel, 7 million Jewish people? Why don't you go there? I do. That's what I do. And I do that because they need to hear what somebody had chutzpah enough to tell me that Jesus was the Messiah. So why am I here in Warwick, Queensland? First time, by the way, love it. Because you have been ordained by God to love all of us. There you go. Thank you. That, beautiful, she said. Because we've been or I've been ordained by God to love all of y'all. Y'all. I don't talk like that, but it works. All y'all. Well, let me give you three other reasons. Number one, just in case you weren't sure, now you can be sure that Jesus is the Messiah. If these three Bible passages help you get it sorted... In just three, imagine if we went through all of the prophecies and it keeps getting clearer and clearer, like an old-time Polaroid coming clearer and clearer. Yeah. So I want you to be convinced that Jesus really is the Messiah and Savior of the world. And if you're watching, where's the camera? Oh, it looks like a humidifier. It's a dual purpose. Wherever you are watching, if you're not yet convinced that Jesus is the Messiah, if you're here in the sanctuary this morning, you're not yet sure, but now you, your eyes are seeing what you've always seen, and you don't know what to do with it, you're going to pray and ask God to forgive you and make you clean before him. And amazingly, he welcomes you just like that. It's going to be awesome. So whether you're at home or here, or wherever you are, whether it's 2024 when I'm giving this talk, or 2094 when somebody's looking at an MP19, it's not too late for you. Second reason I want you to hear this message is so that you have data to pass on to your Jewish mates. And look, if you can witness to Jews, you can witness to anybody. Anyang Haseo. You can tell your Hangul speaking friends that Jesus is the Messiah. You can tell people in Andersons, Nicholsons, Mendelssohns, Cohens, Rabinowitzes, Chengs, even Kiwis. Even they. Everybody should, like you say, benefit from the love God's given us. We should extend it to all. So now you've got data to pass on to them. And the third reason I want you to hear this message today is back in Luke 24. After the passage we read, and you've got to figure, look, Jesus was a pretty good teacher. Agreed? Yeah, pretty, pretty good. So if I, in 30 minutes, have convinced you that Jesus is the Messiah... We had, I had a head start, though. Some, some had already leaned that way. Imagine Jesus teaching you that same lesson. Say, whoa, that, psh, sure. Cleopas and Mrs. Cleopas would probably 
get it just like that, right? No, they didn't get it. We keep reading after that, and it says, while the two were telling them this, oh no, oh, they got up at once, went back to Jerusalem. Oh, here it is. Uh, verse 28, they came near the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he were going further. They said, no, no, stick around. It's time for tea. So Aussie. Um, so he went in to stay with them. He sat down to eat with them, took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. And you, God bless you, are thinking communion. It's not communion. It is the way Jewish people eat meals. You say a blessing, you break the bread, and you pass it around. That, that's how Jewish meals begin. So he's just eating with them. But what did he do when he broke the bread? What did he show them? His hands. The nail prints in his hands. And just then it says, Then their eyes were opened, verse 31, and they recognized him, but he disappeared from their sight. So while he's talking to them on the road to Emmaus or sat down and had the Bible lesson, they didn't get it. Jesus, the best teacher ever, couldn't clearly make it happen until they saw the nail prints in his hand. Oh, you're that guy. The, story, the women went and told, whoa, and their eyes were opened. So in verse 16, it says their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. In verse 31, then their eyes were opened. What's the difference? The difference is not the words that he said, but the Holy Spirit revealing things. And that's that on which you and I lean as well. So when I testify to Goldbergs and Chengs and Parks and Lees and Kims, when I talk to people of any people and I try to share with them, I'll give them data. But you know and I know that I can show them a FedEx arrow, but until they see it, they don't see it. But God, by his Holy Spirit, opens eyes. Aren't you glad for that? And when he opens eyes, then their eyes were opened. Hallelujah. And, they, and then they're famished. You know, they're a little disoriented. They're a little, wait, wait a minute. And then they say, weren't our eyes burning, weren't our hearts, sorry, burning within us like a fire when he's explained the scriptures to us? They got up, ran back to Jerusalem, ran back. They'd been rearranging the pebbles. They ran back to Jerusalem. It's late that Sunday, that Easter Sunday, and they find the 11, because, you know, Judas is gone. And they explain what happened on the road and how he had been recognized, uh, they had recognized the Lord when he broke the bread. I love that. So revelation comes. And so the third reason I'm here is so that you will pray for us. I'm a missionary. I need people to pray for my mission. Mission, God bless us, isn't inside the church. I mean, to some, I get it, and that's fine. Fair enough. But my mission is outside, uh, near the Bernsey statue. My mission is outside among the peoples of the world. I've been to Seoul, been to Buenos Aires, I've been to Jerusalem so many times, and New York. And next week, I go to Nashville, Tennessee. I'm going to Brooklyn. I am. So I'll be gone for several months going to various places around the U.S. and then back uh, for springtime. September 1, I'll be back. But I want you to pray not just for Bob, but for Jews for Jesus. And you have one of those white cards, and you'll see it's not very, it's faint, but there is a, a little stub. There's a perforation there. And for you watching you can write to me at Post Office Box 925, Sydney, 2001. Uh, but here in the sanctuary, would you take that sheet and just tear it right there on the stub? It's the only thing we let you tear in church, right there on the perforation. Um, you can do that. You can do that now. It's not, not wrong. Please do that. Okay, thank you. Um, and you'll have two. The large card is for you. The small card, after you fill it out, is for me. And by that, you extend to me the privilege to speak to you again. So I'm, I'm with you once. I'm in Warwick once. But I can speak to you through the agency of our newsletter from the months and years to come. So you can hear stories of what God's doing in Ukraine, 
with us. I was privileged to go there two years ago, right after the war broke out. Um, what's happening with us in Israel and how we're bringing the gospel to Jew and others in the land at this crucial time. So um, the world gives us opportunities to make his name known. And I want the newsletter to speak to you. So if you'll be kind and fill that out and drop it in an offering or whatever you're doing that, or over in the hall, you can just give that to me after the service as well. And over there, if you like them, some people just love QR codes. <laughs> over in the hall, we've got a little sign on my table. You'll find it with morning tea. I've got a sign that's got a QR code that someone in California, that's our headquarters, makes for me every place, I, every church. They make a different QR code. So if you shoot that QR code, it sends you to a website that identifies you as being here at Warwick United, or Killarney, uh, United, and me and this date. I don't know how they do that. I don't care, but it works. So if you sign up that way, and then we can send you either an electronic or a physical newsletter. We love sending you that. So you can be encouraged and praying for us. If you do that, sweet. We, uh, then my visit here will have been worthwhile. If you pray. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Anzi, thanks for letting me come. And brothers and sisters, um, if you feel like donating or you want to buy products, I've got a square, you know, one of those tap and get out of here. That, you know, it's a you know, little box, little machine. So you can use your credit card. You can say that. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to be with you and to spend this Easter season with you in sharing this, I think, great news message of a great God who loves us and wants us to be with him. Shalom. Let's just pray for you while you are here. So come stand with me, brother. <laughs> Let us pray. God, we just thank you for this work that you've called Bob to do. And we thank you for his uh, encouraging words to us. Thank you that he opens up the scriptures and help us see uh, the wonder and the awesome God we serve. Just pray for his ongoing mission and pray that you will equip him, that you will provide for him and his ministry and for his family at this time. And we mm. pray for the new baby to arrive, that yeah. the new baby will be a blessing and that the family would be blessed through this new child. And so I just pray for his journey back to the States as well. Pray that everything will go according to your plan and your purposes. Yeah. We thank you for his words and for his visit to Warwick at this time. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. So after that inspiring message, let us sing, Lord, your word abiding.
now ask the stewards to come forward and gather our tithes and offerings, please. for the gifts that you have given us, Lord, not only of money, but of time and talent. We bring them back to you now, Lord, offer them back to you for your work in this church, in the wider field in the world, in Bob's message, uh, in his calling and his ministry. We pray that you will bless these offerings, you will pray that we will bless Bob's work for the greater good of your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us, let us come and pray for people in the world. Father, thank you for the people that you have given us in our lives the people that matter the most to us, the people we care about. They are all gifts from you, Father. And we offer prayers for them. We give them over to you. We ask that you will bless them. We ask that those who don't know you will, will come to know you, Lord, that either ourselves or other people will speak to them. We pray for our church in this area, Father, all the churches in this area, that we will work together to spread your word, to be the beacon of light that you call all of us to be. We pray for our church leadership in this presbytery and in the synod, Lord, that they will continue to follow you, to follow your direction, to not be afraid to make a decision that goes against what society may consider right. Father, we pray for the church all over the world, for our brothers and sisters who are being oppressed, who are being punished simply for worshipping you. We pray that you will encourage them, that you will protect them, that they will be your beacons of light. And while we're praying for people, Lord, we pray for their oppressors, that they will come to know you, that they will realise their sins, that 
they will realise they need you. Because, Jesus, you died for every single person, even for Judas Iscariot. So we ask these prayers now through the holy and blessed name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our last hymn is Your Words to Me, and then we'll stand for the benediction. Thank you. go forth from here now to be beacons of your light, to not be afraid to share your word. Lord, that is the mission you put in our hearts. Let us not be afraid. For Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will give us the words we need to say. So let us not be afraid to speak your word today. Let us not be afraid to to live your word today because many people should see our actions and then inquire why do we think this way so let us go forth now and bear your light to the people in this wider world we ask this in Jesus name Amen <laughs>